Good morning. Welcome to Romans. If you're new or you're a guest, I'm Shane, one of the pastors. Uh, we preach you books of the Bible here, and we're working our way through the book of Romans. And so today, <clears throat> we are going to make it our goal uh, to get through a big chunk of Romans chapter 3. And I'm very excited about Romans chapter 3 because this is where uh, the narrative begins to change. If you've been here uh, for this series so far, it's been a little dark, right? Uh, and, and, and it's because uh, the Apostle Paul, it's almost like he's uh, been uh, operating like a very skilled physician up to this point. And he's got a patient uh, who has a terminal disease. A disease that's presently killing them, a disease that will kill them. The death rate for this disease is 100%. And, and, and like a skilled physician, Paul is simply trying to help the patient understand you are going to die. It is a fact. You are doomed, doomed, doomed. And we've been talking about that over and over. Paul's not trying to make the patient feel bad, though. He's not trying to make the patient feel ashamed for having the disease. He's trying to get the patient to accept the fact that they have the disease, to accept the diagnosis, so the patient will willingly accept the cure. And there is a cure. And today we finally get to talk about the cure for the great disease that ails humanity, that separates us from the God who loves us, that causes us pain and destruction and devastation in our lives. And maybe you know the name of this disease. I'm guessing most of you do. It's a three-letter word that most Christians are very familiar with. I just find it super fascinating that up until this point, you can read Romans 1 and 2 for yourself in totality, and, and what you'll discover is the Apostle Paul, he really hasn't named the disease yet. He hasn't just come out with it. He, he's, he's described it, but mostly he's described it in terms of our guilt, right? Like over and over, in, starting in Romans 1.18 through where John left us a couple weeks ago. I mean, Paul has in uh, 20 different ways uh, went out of his way to convince all of us that we're guilty before God, that we've all broken God's law. Jews are guilty for breaking the law of Moses, Gentiles are guilty because we've all broken the internal moral law of God in our hearts. We've all done wrong deep inside. We all know it. And because we've all done wrong, because we've all broken God's law, we are all guilty, guilty, guilty. And because we're guilty, what we deserve is punishment. We deserve is judgment. We deserve is condemnation. We deserve wrath because of our guilt. And some of the wrath of God is presently being poured out. We talked about that in Romans 1, 18 through 32. He's presently just giving people over to the desires that they have. If they want to turn away from him and follow their evil desires, God finally says, okay, go. You can have what you want. So at some level, his wrath is already being revealed, but there's a future aspect of this wrath as well. And, 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 and we're going to receive that because we are guilty before God. There's nothing we can do about it. And Paul has told us this over and over and over. I mean, it's been kind of dark at times because he's just letting us know you are doomed. You are doomed. You are doomed. And there's nothing you can do about it. And he finally just comes out and tells us why. He finally just names the disease in Romans 3, 9. And we're going to pick it up there. And if you're wondering, wondering where Romans 3, 1 through 8 went, it's still there. It's still there. Uh, we're, we're only skipping it because really picking it up here really is where John left us at the end of Romans 2. Paul's really picking it up uh, right here in Romans 3, 9. Romans 3, 1 through 8. Uh, it's kind of a little segue where he's addressing some specific objections to some of the, his Jewish brothers and sisters. And he, we will pick that up again in Romans 9 through 11 because everything he says in the first eight verses of Romans 3, he goes much deeper and in more detail in Romans 9 through 11. So we will be uh, addressing it, but we're picking it up where Paul finally comes out and he names the disease. And what is the disease? The disease has a name and the disease is sin. sin. The whole world is under the power of sin. The whole world is under the power of sin. Sin invaded humanity. In Genesis chapter 3, the great fall when Adam and Eve rebelled against God and were deceived by Satan and in that moment, the whole world was subjugated to the slavery of sin. Satan promised freedom and gave handcuffs, and he still does today. Sin. The whole world is under the power of sin. We could talk tons about sin. We will in Romans 6, Romans 7. But the ultimate reality is it's sin. The sin that we're born into, the sin that we are filled with. 
that makes it virtually impossible for us to obey the perfect law of God. It's like he's telling us why. He hasn't told us why yet. He's only told us that we're all guilty. He's only told us that we've all broken God's law. Now he's explaining why we are guilty, why we break God's law. We break God's law. Basically what he's saying is we sin because we are sinners. We we can't not sin. There's no way. We've been rendered powerless. We cannot perfectly obey God's law. And then in verses 10 through 18, I'm not even going to read it because it's kind of depressing. Uh, But he uh, basically goes out of his way uh, to paint a very graphic picture of sin, the sin that has enslaved humanity, the sin that the whole world is under. And it's just, uh, and he starts there, which we already know, because of sin, because we've all broken God's law, we break God's law because we're filled with sin, because we're under the power of sin, there's no one righteous. No one's innocent before God, not even one. And then from there, in verses 11 through 18, it could be maybe the most graphic depiction, uh, the, 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 the most graphic picture painted by anyone in the New Testament about what sin does, about the power of sin, about where sin leads. I mean, he, 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 he talks about the devastation, the results of it in our lives from the words that we say to each other that are just filled with hatred, that cause division and pain, that destroy relationships, destroy marriages, destroy a nation. I mean, the way we speak to each other, the hate and the bitterness in our words that causes destruction. He talks about uh, the violence and the bloodshed of humanity uh, that's been going on for 6,000 plus years. Years, war after war, uh, since Genesis 4, as uh, soon as sin came into the world, we started to kill each other. God's children begin to murder one another. He talks about it, and it continues to happen. And he goes on and on, painting this. Now, there's a word for this sin that we're all filled with, right? There's a word for this sin that the whole world is under. I'm trying to stay away from like theological words, but there is a word for it that theologians use and it's called depravity. It's moral depravity, that we are depraved, that we are born in sin, that we are born with sin, that we're born uh, uh, with sinful natures. Uh, I just want you to understand that like that, uh, when we're talking about the whole world being under the power of sin and we have the disease of sin, we're chock full of sin, uh, we're depraved, that, that, that doesn't mean uh, uh, that humanity, uh, that people are incapable of doing good and beautiful th- things in the earth, right? I mean, obviously it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean we're incapable of being uh, kind and generous. Obviously uh, we are. Nor uh, does depravity, being under the power of sin, uh, mean that we're always as bad as we always could be, because clearly we're not. Uh, but, 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 but think about that just for a second. Like, 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 what is one of the main reasons that people aren't as bad as they always could be? Like, one of the reasons for that is uh, God has something in place to restrain sin, and that is government. Like, we'll get to it in Romans 3. Like, right? Like, the, the, the truth is, one of the reasons that we're not as bad as we could be is because we fear the, the consequences of being as bad as we could be. There's, there's, there's laws against it. I mean, just, just like, just imagine America. Just imagine America. If all authority and all structure, all government, all police, all authority was just magically removed and there was no consequences for sin, what do you think America would be like? Like, I, you know, listen, listen. I, I, I'm not, I, I, sometimes Hollywood makes me crazy. Uh, because of the way they depict God. And, uh, but sometimes Hollywood is incredibly prophetic. And, and, and they tap into depravity in ways that they probably don't even understand. What, what I mean by that is, have any of you watch, ever watched like, uh, uh, not that I'm endorsing it or promoting it, but have any of you uh, ever watched like The Walking Dead? The Walking Dead. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Zombie apocalypse. Yeah. Violence and murder. <laughs> and then, and, and <laughs> you don't like it? Brittany is offended right now that some of you watched that disgusting show. But the way they depict humanity, because all social structures have been wiped out, the way they depict humanity, not just in that series, but in any show, when, when, it's, when, when, when all structures are gone, when a catastrophe, the way they depict humanity is profound, isn't it? 
I mean, everyone's just killing each other, stealing from each other. Anything goes, it's every person for themselves. That is where sin would take us. We happen to be restrained by the law of man and by consequences in government. It's one of the very purposes for government. Say what you want about government. Well, we can talk lots about that in Romans 13 when we get there. Say whatever you want about it. It is from God, and one of the purposes is to restrain sin because this world is under the power of sin. And this world needed to be rescued, delivered, and set free from the power of sin. Because one of the main things sin does is it drives a wedge in our relationship with God. It breaks the fellowship that God wanted to have with us from the very beginning in Genesis 1 and 2. It's sin. Sin is what destroys the relationship with God. Sin is what brings all the pain and devastation and injustice and violence to this world. And I say that because I am so fascinated and so frustrated that God so often seems to be the one blamed for the state of the world. Like it's, everyone wants to blame God. Like if God was good, if God this, if God that, every time I hear that, I say the same thing to people. Read the first two pages of the book. <laughs> Read it. Genesis 1, Genesis 2. That's what God wanted. God's original design, God's original plan, it was beautiful. It was perfection. We ruined it in the garden. We turned our backs on God we were deceived by the enemy, and we were kidnapped, taken prisoner, taken captive by Satan, sin, and death, and we needed to be rescued. And that is what we get to talk about this morning, God's great rescue plan, which leads us to verses 19 and 20. Verses 19 and 20. He says this, to me, uh, verses 19 and 20, Romans 1, it's, it's like, uh, this is Paul's summary statement of everything he said starting in verse 18 of chapter 1 all the way up to now. He just, he, he, he's concise here. He, he just basically puts it all in two sentences. And you're saying, well, why didn't he just do it in two sentences to begin with? Because Paul's a preacher and we're long-winded. We like to say it over and over in different ways before we finally say the point is... That's what he's doing here, though. Look at how he says this. He says, now we know. Now we know. Like maybe we didn't know for sure before, but now we know. He doesn't mean anything other than now by chapter 3. By chapter 3, verse 19, as he's writing, he's like, okay, okay, we all get it now. Now we know. What do we know? We know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So the law of God is speaking. That's everything we've been looking at. Paul is a lawyer. He's been talking about the law. People think they can be made right by the law. They think they can be innocent before God by observing the law. They think they can be innocent before God by their own moral behavior. So Paul is saying, now we know that the law is clearly speaking. It is speaking loudly. It is speaking clearly to all who are under it. Who is under the law? Who's under the law? Everyone is under the law. He's made that point over and over. Every human being is under the law of God. So the law of God is speaking to all who are under. What's the law of God saying? What's it been saying the entire time? What, let's pretend I'm the law. I'm obviously far from the law, but let's pretend I'm the law. If I'm the law, here's what I'm saying to everyone who's under me. You broke me. You broke me. And because you broke me, you are guilty before God. That's what the law is saying. Why is the law of God so clearly saying this? Is this just like a doctor trying to make a patient feel horrible for being sick? No. Why is the law of God saying this? So that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. The law of God is telling us very clearly that we're all guilty and it's doing it for a purpose. And the purpose is to shut our mouths. That's what God's trying to do. That's, that's not God being mean. Like what it's saying is, God's simply trying to get us all to a place where we stop defending ourselves. Where we stop, stop trying to convince ourselves that we don't have the disease. 
so that we're not the patient that looks the doctor in the eyes as the doctor's showing us the x-rays, proving that we are filled with the disease. Going, That's ridiculous. I feel fine. <laughs> the doctor wants us to receive the treatment. The doctor wants us convinced. What this is saying, God is just going out of his way to convince us all that we're guilty before him because he doesn't want us to, def- he wants us to humble ourselves. He wants to confess our great need of the cure so that we would turn and put our faith in the one who can save us and rescue us. He wants us to stop defending ourselves here and now because there's going to be a day, like I'm not trying to ruin your lunch, but there's going to be a day that you die and you stand before God and the whole world will be held accountable for the law they are guilty of breaking. And God wants you to stop defending yourself now because I promise you in that day, you will not defend yourself. Listen, I don't care how good you are, how moral you are, how well behaved you think you are. When you stand before God, you, the, no one's even gonna have a mild thought in that day of saying, well, I was a pretty good person. I, you're not, I've talked to so many people so arrogant. I mean, well, well, when I die, I get to heaven. Baba, tell God exactly what I think. Tell him I disagree with him. You know what you're going to tell God when you stand before him? You know what you're going to tell him? Nothing. Your mouth will be silenced as the holy, all holy, all perfect, all knowing, all powerful creator of the universe sets before you, sets before me all of our sin, every one of them. And it's contrasted with the light of his perfection and holiness. We're going to know the truth in that day. We will not even think about defending ourselves. All we will do is bow our knees and bow our heads and confess with our mouth, you are right. True and just are your judgments. True and just are your ways. I am guilty. That's all we're going to say. Here's the deal. In that day, at that moment, it's too late. It's too late to receive the cure. He wants us to receive it now. He says in verse 20, understand what he's saying. The very purpose of the law of God is to make us conscious of the disease. That's why God designed the law to begin with. Like, in God's heart, he was never setting the bar here so that we go, I can get over that. He was setting the bar here so that we'd all look and go, I could never get over that. That's the purpose of the law. Uh, Those 663 commands and the law of Moses, the moral law of our hearts that we all know that we've broken, the very purpose of you feeling that that was wrong, that I shouldn't have done that, all of it was designed just to make us aware of sin. It It was like a test that your professor gave you and it was impossible for you to pass and that's why he gave it to you so that you would fail. He wasn't trying to trick you or be mean to you. He was just trying to convince you that you're not half as smart as you think you are. That's the law. It's the straight edge of God's moral perfection. It's the straight edge of God's moral standard that is designed to let us all see how crooked and broken and sinful we are. It's like the doctor's way of getting the patient to say, you are right. I have the disease. Give me the cure. And beloved, there is a cure. There is a cure to that which ails humanity most. And what ails humanity most is sin. The power of sin. That is what ails us most. What we most need is to be forgiven of the penalty of sin and set free of the power of sin. And that is what God has made available to us in Jesus Christ. I tell you the truth. That's what ails us most. 
What ails us most is not the need for more money or a better job. What ails us most as husbands is not that our wives would be just a little more sensitive to our sexual needs. What ails us most as wives is not the need that our husband just be a little bit more sensitive to our emotional needs. Those things may be important. That's not what ails us most. What ails us most is not even the need for healing, for sickness in our body. What ails us most is the disease of sin. And what we most need is to be forgiven of the penalty of it and set free of the power of it. And that is what Jesus Christ has done for us, beloved. That is the cure. That's Romans 3, 21. This is where the whole thing changes. Romans 3, 21. The law is designed to make you conscious of your sin so you confess you have the disease. But now, the whole thing has been building to this but now. This is like God saying, this is how it is, doomed. Because this is how it is, this is what I have done to bring a cure. But now, you know, you know, I was like an inch away from titling this sermon, the most beautiful butt you've ever seen. <laughs> I was, I was, but I knew some of my wound too tight brothers and sisters would be a little offended. You know who you are. So, so I didn't want to offend you. So, so, so I didn't title it the best butt you've ever seen, but it doesn't change the fact that it is. This, this is the most beautiful butt you will ever see. It really is. Beloved, this butt in Romans 3.21 changes everything. This butt, the butt of God, leads from shame and guilt it leads from condemnation. It leads away from a meaningless existence on planet Earth where you're just always trying to get a little bit more and shove something else into this aching hole inside of you. It leads away from that. It leads away from eternal death. And it leads to forgiveness and innocence, a life of meaning on this Earth where you're caught up into the life of the kingdom of God. And ultimately, it leads to being put back into a right relationship with the God who made us in a very real way. This but takes us right back to Genesis one and two. This but takes us right back to the Garden of Eden and restores us fully to our relationship with God and invites us to now rule and reign with him to bring his kingdom to this earth in every sphere of life and to one day rule and reign with him over a new heavens and a new earth. This but changes everything. This is the but that has been the catalyst for every great love story ever told. This is the but that has been the catalyst for every fairy tale every child has ever fallen in love with because, beloved, this is the butt of the fierce and ferocious and relentless love of God for people who do not deserve it, people just like me and people just like you. But now, but now, but now, apart from the law, apart from your behavior, apart from your performance, apart from your ability to keep God's commands, a righteousness, an innocence, a way to be declared innocent in God's eyes has been manifest, has been revealed, has been made known to you. Listen, like, there's a huge part of me that just wants to go, that just wants to say to you, this righteousness that's been revealed, he says it's the righteousness that the law and the prophets testify to. There's a big part of me that just wants to say this righteousness that's been revealed, that the whole Old Testament is pointing to, this righteousness is Jesus Christ. Boom, flex, mic drop, and walk off the stage. Like, that's what a part of me wants to do, but I know that would leave some of you confused. So next week, we're going to talk at length about how Jesus Christ is our righteousness. But for today, I want to make it simple. Like, what I want to do today, as best I can, is I want to, it's like we're, we're, we're painting this beautiful, 
beautiful picture. And in, in today's kind of like the background, broad strokes and the background. And through Romans 4, Romans 5, Romans 6, Romans 7, Romans 8, we're going to fill it in with great detail. And by the time we are done, we will be overwhelmed with the beauty of the picture of the gospel of God. But so for right now, let's just think of Romans 3, uh, 21 as this. Think of it this way. But now God has in the person, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ made a way for guilty people to be made innocent and still have his justice be upheld. I'll say that again. That is just a quote from Pastor Shane Holden. But now, but now, God has in the person, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ made a way for guilty people to be made innocent and still have his justice be upheld. And that part's important. I'm just going to touch it now and we'll come back to it later. But I just, because that's what God was, like that was his dilemma at some level, right? Like, 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 like he's got these people and they're under the power of sin. They're incapable of obeying his law. So they are guilty, but he loves them. His heart is for them and he wants to restore them. He wants to make them innocent, but he knows to make them innocent. He can't suspend his justice because his justice is directly linked to his goodness. So he can't suspend his justice and just go, well, I guess I'm just going to give him a pass. His justice has to be upheld as he declares guilty people to be innocent. And, and I'm saying that because that seems to be the marker of offense uh, for many people, that his justice needed to be upheld. It especially seems to be offensive to the younger generation. And I have these conversations with young people all the time. I find it incredibly fascinating that they're like, they're offended that God's justice needed to be upheld as he forgave guilty people and made them innocent. And it's fascinating to me because it's a generation that cries for justice. Like, I mean, in everything, justice, justice, justice. It's got to be fair. It's got to be fair. It's got to be equitable for everyone. We're all exactly the same, and that's not fair. That's not fair. That's not fair. That's not fair. That's all you hear. I mean, at nauseam to the point where you're just like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Again, we should dress the same. We should all be able to play shirts and skins. Yep, nothing should be different. Everything should be fair. But then as it pertains to the justice of God, for some reason, there's an offense. I wonder why. We'll come back to that. But for now, let's look at this. How do we obtain this innocence before God? Guilty doomed. How do we obtain this innocence from God? What does he say? Verse 22, he tells us how to obtain this innocence from God. He says, this innocence from God, in verse 22, is given through what? Through your best effort? Through you trying really hard? You read your Bible every day? You never take a sip of alcohol. You wouldn't even think about watching The Walking Dead. <laughs> you fast twice a week. You tithe 30% of your income. You dot every I. You cross every T. Is that how we obtain this righteousness? It's given through our religious effort? No, it's given through what? It's given through faith. <laughs> I just got to believe. It's just given through faith in Jesus Christ to a select few chosen in eternity passed by God. Is that what it says? Who, 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 who's it given to? Through faith? Oh, 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 anyone who would just simply choose to believe. Just choose to put their faith and their trust in the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ on their behalf. <laughs> you know, we've heard these things so many times. I think the beauty and the splendor and the punch is just sometimes diminished. But could you imagine being this group of people reading this letter? Like sincerely, like, like they just got to be like, they read verse 22 and they've got to be like, what? Pause. What? Say that again, Paul. We got to read that again. Let's read that again. And they had to be just perplexed overwhelmed, right? Like, like you got to be thinking, Paul, you spent all this time convincing us that we had this terminal disease called sin that makes it impossible to live up to God's law, making us all guilty before him and deserving of death and condemnation as a result. And there's nothing we can do about it. And you told us this over and over and over again. And so now in one brush of a pen, you're telling us he did something about it for us. And all we have to do is believe it. And now we are just made innocent. That's crazy, Paul. That sounds way too good to be true. Paul's probably like, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know, he says back. And he, he says, and it's, both, it's for both Jew and Gentile, you guys. There's no difference. Everyone can receive the cure. Anyone can have it. Anyone can receive it. They just have to put their faith, their trust in the work and the person of Jesus Christ. And if they do, they will be made righteous. 
profound. There is a way for sinners to be made innocent. It is through faith in Jesus Christ. But what is this faith? What are we putting this faith in? And when we put our faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ, what are we actually putting our faith in? What is it that he did that we're trusting in? And what do we then receive as a result of putting our faith in him? Verses 23 through 25 describe in great detail what this righteousness, this innocent is, and how it's obtained for us, and how God upholds his justice as he gives it to us. He says in verses 23 and 24 specifically, all who believe in Jesus Christ will be made innocent, righteous, given right standing before God, because all are equally guilty, is what he's saying in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What's the glory of God? Think of the glory of God as his perfect moral standard, his kingdom, eternal life with him, and everything that revolves around his kingdom. We've all sinned, so we all fall short of God's perfect moral standard. We all fall short of eternal life with God. So in verse 24, he says, so because all have sinned, all are equally guilty, all are justified freely, equally and freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Romans 3.24, this verse along with the one that follows, Romans 3.25, beloved, these verses are like the heart of the gospel. These verses are the great game changer. This is the heart of the good news that was the catalyst for the reformation. It was the heartfelt cry of Martin Luther and the reformers that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and nothing need be and nothing can be added to it. It is a free gift given to guilty sinners. What do we have? What happens? What do we have? Well, he says in verse 24, you are justified. You're justified. When you put your faith in Jesus, you put your trust in what he did for you on the cross, the personal work of Jesus Christ, you are justified. Now, uh, remember Paul was a lawyer. He uses legal terms to define this. It's pros and cons to that. I'll try to talk about that in a little bit if I have time. But the Greek word here for justified is uh, dekelu. And it literally means to justify, to declare righteous, to prove innocent, or to vindicate. But what we need to understand, this is important, especially if you're one of our Bible college students, jot this down. This, this is not something that happens in you. This is something that happens to you. This isn't about some change inside. This isn't about your behavior being changed. This has nothing to do with anything you do or anything that happens inside of you. This is something that happens completely to you. It's God's declaration over your life that you are innocent of all charges. Nothing to do with your changed behavior. So Shane, are you implying that our behavior doesn't change when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and are justified? No, I'm not implying that. Something does begin to happen in you the moment you are justified. What begins to happen in you the moment you are justified is you begin to be sanctified. God begins to transform you and change you little by little by little by little. Sometimes the process is very slow for some of us. Sometimes it's even hard to see for some of us. But slowly over the progression of your life, you are transformed more and more into the image of Jesus. That sanctifying work will happen the whole time we are on this earth. It's what the Holy Spirit is doing in our hearts and doing in our lives. But that's not justification. Justification is the legal declaration of God over your life where he vindicates you of all charges. All charges are wiped away. Simply put, it just means that you are innocent. Innocent. The way you probably learn it your little kids is what? Just as if I had never sinned. And as corny as that is, it's really true. It means all of your sin, all of it, is washed away. Past, present, the sin you committed on your way here. Some of you, you know who you are. The sin some of you may commit when you leave and drive out of the parking lot. We have cameras out there. We know who you are. All of it. All of it, all of it, you're innocent. You're innocent in a way in which you can never be found guilty. 
Some of you, please hear me. Some of you live under such shame and guilt and condemnation as if God is just disgusted with you all the time because of your weakness and your flaws and your sin. What you need to understand is that when God looks at your life, he calls you innocent. Right now, as you sit in your seat, you're innocent. You'll never be more innocent in his eyes than you are right now. Not even the day you stand before him and are transformed completely into his image. You will not be more innocent then than you are right now. You are innocent. <laughs> you, say, you say, Shane, Shane, you're talking crazy. Like, how can this be possible? I, I don't even deserve that. Like some of you may have the voice of the legalist rising up right now. A little Pharisee inside going, I don't know about that. That's possible. We're going to get to him in a minute. But some of you may have the other voice rising up inside of you. The voice of self-hatred. The voice of shame. Rising up inside of you right now as I'm saying these words. And you're saying, I can't. It's just hard to believe. I, like, I, I, I don't deserve the exchange. You don't understand. You don't, you don't understand what I've done. Like, I, I've committed adultery. I've been immoral. Like, you don't know what my, how can I just be innocent by putting my faith in Jesus? Like, how is that possible? Like, I can just look at my life and call me innocent just because I put my faith in Jesus when my life is such a train wreck. Shane, you don't understand my past, my struggles, my flaws, and my sins. And maybe I don't, but I understand mine. I know them full well. I know my present sin and struggle, and I know what my past looked like, and I completely understand the feeling that I do not deserve this. And beloved, the beautiful reality of it is we don't. We don't deserve it. Amen? There's a word for this that makes it possible. The word for this is what? It is grace. What does he say? He says we are justified freely, freely, freely. Freely in the original language means freely by his what? By his grace. The Greek word here is charis. And if you've been around church for 30 seconds, you have heard uh, grace interpreted correctly, but not completely as uh, unmerited favor. This is the undeserved and unmerited favor of God. It really is. And what that means is just that, that God does this because he wants to. Let's make it as simple as we can. That God, God does this whole thing just because he chooses to love me. Not even because there's anything lovable in me. He doesn't do this because there's anything good in me. He does it because he's good. He does it because he wants me as his son to be restored to him in a right relationship. I deserve none of it. That's grace. It's completely unmerited. It means I cannot deserve it. I cannot work for it. That's what grace means, beloved. Grace means there's not, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, then grace means there's nothing you can do to ever make God love you more than he loves you more than he loves you right now. And grace means there's nothing you could ever do to make God love you less than he loves you right now. This is completely undeserved, unworked for, unmerited. It has zero to do with my work or my effort. It is completely the gift of God to sinners. Just to be received by faith. Unmerited favor. Beautiful as that is. It's inclusive of something else. The word grace, charis, doesn't just mean unmerited favor. It also means the cause of delight. Come on. That's beautiful. It is the unmerited favor given by God to guilty sinners that causes him great delight. That's just freakishly beautiful. Sincerely, like that part of grace needs to be talked about more. Because again, I, 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 like too many of us just have this idea that God has begrudgingly given this grace to us. You know, like, well, I guess, foul little sinner, but they have put their faith in Jesus. 
so I guess I have to forgive him, innocent. <laughs> like he's mostly disgusted with us. You know, like he forget because we got it on a loophole, the legal loophole of the law. So God stuck with us. He's not really happy about it though. That is so far removed from the truth of the heart of God. Beloved, he delights in justifying you. He delights in giving you unmerited favor. I, I tell you the truth, if you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, you've never allowed him to make you innocent, to cleanse you of all of your sin and to restore you to a right relationship with him, if you will allow him to do that today, he will take great delight in it. He will take great delight in making you his son or his daughter and restoring you to a right relationship with him. In fact, Jesus said that God would take such delight in it that the angels in heaven would have a party and a celebration before the throne of God because it brings God such great joy and great pleasure to bring his sons and daughters home. This is the delight of God, beloved, and it is incredibly beautiful. But you, you, you can hear this all though, and, and you can say, you can say, well, how, how is he just if he's doing this? Like, this, is, this doesn't sound like, you said he's gonna uphold his justice. How is his justice upheld? Like this doesn't sound like a just judge. Like this sounds like a judge who had a, someone convicted of murder stand before him and the guy really did the murder because you got it on your iPhone and the judge is seeing it. Like he really did the murder and the guy's like, yep, that was me, I really did that. And then the judge just says, okay, you're good, you're innocent, go ahead. She sounds like that's what you're saying. And none of us would want a judge like that in the natural, would we? Would anyone want that, we'd want that guy disbarred, yes? Or that girl disbarred, yes? <laughs> right? We don't want to judge like, oh, yeah, you did, yeah, you committed murder. Nah, don't worry about it. You're off the hook. It's all good. I want you to know that's not, that's not what's happening here. Hear me. Uh, God's mercy, God's grace uh, t towards us, it doesn't make a mockery of God's holiness or justice or the demands that his justice makes against rebel sinners. That is not what's happening. God's like, ah! I understand you're just human. You can't help it. Nah, you're good. That's not what's happening. This judge, he did declare the man guilty of the crime. Sentenced him to death because that was the penalty for the sin of murder. Guilty. Then this judge pushed himself away from his desk. He took off his robe and he walked down behind the bench and he said to the man... You are guilty and you deserve to die. Now take the cuffs off of him and put them on me because I am going to pay the price that he deserves. That's what our God has done, beloved. Mercy given as justice is met. A pardon for the guilty sinner at the expense of the righteous judge. Our God in and of himself met the requirements that his own justice demanded. It is as simple as it is beautiful. It says it in verses 24 through 25. He justifies us three, freely through the what? The redemption that came by Christ Jesus, referring to the cost paid by Christ to set sinners free. Again, the point is as simple as it is beautiful. We were sold as slaves to sin, Satan and death. Jesus paid the price demanded for our release. It's not just that God winked at it. And that is why I recoil so often when I hear people say, uh, because what he says, read it carefully in verse 25. It says, it says this redemption, this justification is all possible. Why? Because because God presented Jesus Christ as our sacrifice of atonement through our faith in the shedding of his blood. Like that, that's what happened. There was a high price paid for this freedom, this justification. And that is why, honestly, I just, I, I recoil. Like I've been preaching this gospel for, for, for uh, 28 years. I, I started preaching this gospel <laughs> about 30 seconds after I received it. I'm not kidding. Because I, I don't know, I was 21, 22. I was a horrible human being. And uh, when this became real to me, like Jesus Christ paid 
a price for me just because he loved me and wanted me, wanted to forgive me and restore me. Like I, I, like, I can't explain to you the way that hit my heart. I just was like, this is the best news I've ever heard, and the whole world needs to hear it. So I started telling him, like, instantly, like, instantly. I left this retreat where I just became real to me, and I drove directly to the house I used to live in, right across the street from this little uh, bar uh, on the east side of Madison, because I knew my friends would be there. It was like Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. I knew they'd be in there smoking weed and drinking Michelob because the football games were about to start. I knew they'd be there. So, so you guys, I have been saved for like 30 seconds, and I drive there, I bust into the house, and I'm just like, <laughs> I mean, seriously, and they're just all there smoking weed, drinking Michelob, just like, they all look at me, there's a room full of my old friends, they're like, dude, what are you, where have you been? Because I've been a little bit underground, because I've been trying to figure out this whole God thing, and I just simply informed them. I found it. I found it. Like, what are you talking about? You found what? I found it. I found what we're looking for. You guys, I found what we're looking for. Something, something, drugs, something, alcohol, something, girls. I, I, I found it. I, I, I found it. it. It's Jesus. His name is Jesus. I found him. I'm on my way there. I can take you to him. Let's go. Like, f- fully expecting them to hop in my car and just come with me and fall in love with the Jesus that I just fell in love with. And they all said, you're crazy. You've lost your mind. It will wear off. The point is, I've been preaching this gospel since the day I got saved. I can't help it. And I recoil inside every time. I've heard it so many times. So please don't send me this email. If the legalist in you is rising up, please don't send me this email because I recoil inside every time I hear it. I've been accused of it so many times. You're just preaching cheap grace. Sloppy agape. Messy mercy. Greasy grace. I've heard them all, save it. And hear me. Oh, dear legalist, hear me. I am not preaching cheap grace. I'm preaching free grace. I grew up on the east side of Madison, a very poor neighborhood, eating government cheese. That's how I grew up. Where I grew up, free and cheap, they were very different things. Free was way better. The thing is, though, it's free. The reason I started preaching this 30 seconds after it hit my heart is because I understood it was free for me. But there's nothing cheap about this redemption. Amen? It cost him everything, beloved. It cost him his very life to purchase this for us. That's what he's saying. God presented Jesus as our sacrifice of atonement, the one who would pay the price in fullness for us and absorb the wrath of God against our sin. Verse 26 says, this is how God is both just and the justifier. And also in verse 26, he's letting us know how Old Testament saints were engrafted into the gospel. I don't have time to explain that. I, I, I just want you to understand that, 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 that when it says that, 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 that Jesus was our sacrifice of atonement, that is Paul's way of helping us understand that God's justice has been upheld as his mercy has been given. Uh, the, I gotta do this quickly, but I want you to get this, especially our Bible college students, that, that word there, in, in, in Romans uh, 3, uh, 25. Go back to 3.25, if you would, please. That, that word there in Romans 3.25, sacrifice of atonement, God presented Christ as our sacrifice uh, uh, of atonement. Uh, that, that, that word uh, in, in the Greek is the word uh, hilasterion. 
uh, it's used many times uh, in the Bible, uh, and it means, uh, it means to uh, the means by which a broken relationship uh, would be made right, especially if there was offense in the relationship that broke it. It also means to appease the wrath of, to meet the requirements necessary to allow the relationship uh, to be restored. And the, the, the literal rending of the word would be propitiation, that God presented Christ as our propitiation, or literally as the w- salvation by substitution, that Jesus would die in my place and be the one to absorb the wrath of God against my sin and make a way for me to be restored, to uphold the justice, uh, the justice of God. And, and that is what happened on this cross. And I know people don't like hearing it. I know that's where the younger generation starts to get offended that someone needed to die for justice to be served. But, but understand that is part of what this cross uh, is about. Jesus was our propitiation. He, he, he was absorbing the wrath of God on the tree. But it's important to understand what was God's wrath that was poured out on Jesus? What was his wrath poured out against? And I'm saying this because I think sometimes, maybe it's semantics, but sometimes the way this is presented leads people to what I think to be a little bit of a wrong conclusion because sometimes the way this is presented is as if God was so mad at you and you and you, you foul, rotten little sinners, that Jesus had to get on that tree and take the whooping that you personally deserved. And maybe it's just semantics and maybe there is some level of truth wrapped up in that, but ultimately, what is it that Jesus absorbed the wrath of God against? What was God's wrath poured out on cross on Christ against? What was it poured out against? It was poured out against sin, that's right. The wrath of God was poured out upon the sin that enslaves human beings, the sin that this whole world is under, the sin that destroys our relationship with him, the sin that causes the pain and devastation in our lives and in this earth. And on that tree, Jesus Christ absorbed the entirety of the wrath of God against the sin of entire humanity so that we could be redeemed, that we could be bought back, that the price could be paid against sin so that we could be forgiven. God's justice was upheld as his mercy was given. And some people hear this, even though I've tried to present it in that way, and they lash out at God as if this is somehow cosmic child abuse. I have heard that so many times. That just sounds like child abuse, like the father was so mad he made his son take the whooping that someone else deserved, child abuse. If you're hearing that, you are misunderstanding the heart of God. You couldn't be misunderstanding the heart of God more, and you couldn't be misunderstanding what I am saying more than you are if that's what you are hearing. But I have heard so many people say that over the years, just completely, completely to misunderstand the heart of God. Like, beloved, this isn't something that was like put on Jesus. Like, I'm so mad at him that you gotta get on that tree so I can vent my wrath again. That's not what's happening here. This was a conversation that happened in the Godhead in eternity past. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God, three distinct persons connected in a way that I can't even explain from eternity past. It's not like they're separate people and the Father's off judging the world while Jesus is down fishing. And that's just it's absurd. It's absurd. They're one. They've been one from eternity past. What the Father experiences, the Son experiences, the Spirit experiences, they are one God with three distinct persons. And this conversation about what it would cost to redeem humanity and pay the price that his justice would require, it happened long before you and I were ever on this earth, beloved. This was agreed upon. They knew. The Father knew. It would cost him his son to put us here and then restore us. He knew we'd be kidnapped. He knew that a ransom would need to be paid. He knew justice would have to be observed. He knew that it would only be the selfless, sacrificial act of love from his son that would do it. He knew this in advance. It's John 3.16. It doesn't say, for God so hated the world that he killed his only begotten son. What does it say? For God so, come on, we all know this one. It's at every football game. 
For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave, he freely gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Freely he gave, freely. And freely the son endured the wrath against sin. Freely, voluntarily. If you have some idea that, well, Jesus just had to do this. He just had to jump in the train of God's wrath, jump in front. That's absurd. Jesus chose to do this. John 10, 18, Jesus himself said it. No one takes my life from me, but freely I lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. That's what he said. And then he said, this is the command I receive from my father. One command did Jesus Christ, the eternal son of God, receive from his father. And that one command was you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. This will be your choice. And I tell you the truth, the whole time Jesus was walking on this earth, he knew at any moment he could call down a legion of angels and end the whole thing. He knew he could reveal his glory at any time. He knew this was his choice. And beloved, he chose it. He chose to endure the wrath of God against sin for you and for me. And Hebrews 12.2 12, says that he did it for the joy that was set before him. The joy. He endured the cross and scorned the shame of it for the joy that was set before him. And what was the joy that was set before Jesus? What was the joy? What was it? It was you. It was me. Like at some level, it was this moment. He was seeing 2018 on Alaska, Wisconsin. He was seeing your face. He was seeing all the houses around this building in on Alaska and Holman and La Crosse. He's seeing all the pain and all the dysfunction and all the sin. He was seeing every single face. You specifically. You or the joy that was set before him because he knew what he was doing because the conversation happened in eternity past. He knew that he was making a way for you to be redeemed, for you to be forgiven, for you to be made innocent, for you to be restored to right relationship with the Father, for you to be presented to him as his eternal partner for eternity. Beloved, that is what Jesus was thinking about. That's what he was thinking about when they were beating him and spitting on him and mocking him. That's what he was thinking about when they whipped him 40 times and they tore the flesh from his body. That's what he was thinking of and that's what motivated him when the soldiers forced him to carry his own cross up that hill. And that's what he was thinking about when he was hanging on that cross freely giving his life as a ransom for many. Because he knew, he knew that his shed blood would be the cure for all who would believe. He knew that he would receive for himself the reward of his suffering. And that is you and that is me. And that is all that choose to put our faith in what he did for us on that cross. It is the cure and it is beautiful. Amen. You know, stand your feet. There's lots more I could say. But next week is coming. <laughs> we'll pick it up right here next week. Hey, real quick as I pray. The sermon's over. This is an appendum. You know that word, uh, sacrifice of atonement, propitiation, hilasterion? Uh, That's the same word that's used in Hebrews 9.5 for the uh, cover on the tabernacle, uh, on the Ark of the Covenant. If you don't know what the Ark of the Covenant is, uh, just go home and watch Indiana Jones. (laughs) But uh, real quick, in the Old Testament, uh, the Ark of the Covenant is what God had them build. And then he had them build this huge temple. And in the middle of the temple was the holy place, the most holy place, the holy of holies. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And uh, it had a gold cover called the atonement cover, the mercy seat, the hilasterion, the propitiation. Same word used by Jesus, about Jesus in Romans 3.25, right? That's not that. And it's got these two 
big cherubim, these two big angels uh, in gold on either side. And then God's presence, God's very presence. In the Old Testament, this is where it dwelt, his manifest presence. Now it dwells in us, but then it dwelt there. And it looked down on the Ark of the Covenant. And in the, under the mercy seat were the two stone tablets, uh, the Ten Commandments. And so the Israelites lived knowing that uh, God was always looking down and his presence was always seeing the law they were guilty of breaking. So they just always lived knowing they were guilty. So the law and the prophets testify to the righteousness that's been revealed now, right? All the sacrifices that you see in the Old Testament, they're all pointing to this. Once a year, specifically at Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest for the Israelites would take a perfect lamb, lay his hands on it, and technically that lamb got set free. And I don't have time to explain all that. The, he laid his hands on a perfect uh, lamb or goat, symbolically transferring the sin of the people uh, uh, to that goat. And then the animal would be sacrificed, and some of the blood would be taken uh, by the high priest into the most holy place where he would pour it on the mercy seat, the hilasterium, the propitiation. He'd pour it there on the mercy seat so that when God looked down, he didn't see the law of the people were guilty of breaking, but the blood that was shed to atone for their sin. That's what the mercy seat was. Jesus is our hilasterion. Jesus is our propitiation. What Paul is saying, Jesus is our mercy seat. When he shed his blood and you put your faith in what he did for you on the cross, you live the rest of your life knowing that when the Father looks down on you, he doesn't see the law that you are guilty of breaking. He sees the perfect blood of his son that was shed to pay the price for your sins. And the beautiful thing about this sacrifice is it's the last one that was ever needed. The last one that was ever needed. Hebrews 10, 11, and 12, it talks about the sacrifices of the Old Testament high priest and how they had to be offered over and over, day after day, year after year, because the blood of animals couldn't really cleanse us of our sin. But when this high priest, Jesus, made his final sacrifice, it says that he sat down at the Father's right hand. You know one thing you'd never find in the most holy place? In the, in the tabernacle of Moses, you know what you'd never find in there where the Ark of the Covenant was? One thing you would never, ever find ever? A stool. They weren't allowed to sit. They weren't allowed to sit to symbolize the work was never done. But when this high priest, our ultimate propitiation, offered the full and final sacrifice, beloved, he sat down saying to all of us, it's over. It is enough. I know the world would want you to be ashamed that blood was shed. I tell you the truth. The blood that was shed makes atonement for our sin. The blood that was shed renders all the accusations of Satan against you meaningless. Let us never, ever be ashamed of the blood that was shed to pay for our sins. Jesus Christ is our mercy seat. If you have never put your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you can today. You can do it as you're standing where you're standing. It's your choice. You can choose to put your faith in Jesus Christ right now as you're driving home later today. But if you will, he will delight and justifying you and calling you innocent and bringing you into his family. Father, thank you for who you are. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it just, it seems lame to just say thank you. But we mean it, God. We're just so grateful for your love, for your mercy, for your grace for your redemption, for your justification. We are so grateful that you did for us what we never could have done for ourselves. God, I, I pray for anyone who's maybe never put their faith in the shed blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins. I pray that today would be the day the scales would fall off and they would simply confess they have a disease 
and they want the cure. And they would allow you to cleanse them, to delight in bringing them home to yourself. I pray that there would be great fruit born from this simple message of the gospel in your kingdom. And I pray for those of us that are already believers, that you would restore to us the joy of our salvation, that this would come back to life for us in a new way, in a fresh way, and that the enemy would not be allowed to pull us away from believing the truth of who we are in you because, Jesus, you shed your blood to make us innocent. God, I simply ask you by the end of Romans 8 that you would cause us as a people to be so secure in your love that the enemy would simply not be allowed to confuse us with condemnation anymore. So have your way, God. I Have your way. Have your way in our lives. I pray that everything that came from your heart would take root in our hearts. Anything that was just me, I pray that it would fall away. Ultimately, I pray that you would receive the fullness of the reward of your suffering, Jesus, because you are worthy of it. We pray these things for your glory, and I pray these things just because I know that you so love your people. And all God's people said, amen.